My favorite topic to write about, uh, I mean, in terms of sports, is probably baseball. I think it's first and most orderly. I grew up an Indians fan, my father taking me down to the old stadium, and you know, the memories of West Third Street Bridge and sitting on top of his shoulder, seeing Lake Erie. I could still sort of see the sailboats out there. And then you go into uh, the old stadium, and you know, I grew up in a black and white three channel world. So whenever you would see a baseball game on TV, the infield was gray because it's black and white. So you would come out through those portals at the old stadium, which was so huge, and all of a sudden you see this incredible green grass, and it just felt like it went on forever. And um, it was just a, it was a father and son thing. Uh, just like a lot of my friends now, they grew up in football families where, you know, it's the tailgating and Sundays. We were not that. We were baseball fans. So. Baseball, I think, is that's why if the Indians were to win the World Series, that would be the most meaningful thing to me because of the connection with my dad. I, for years, I wrote they went to the World Series in '54, and I was born in '55, and um, I probably started following baseball in the early '60s, and they've never played a meaningful late season game until 1994, whereupon the baseball strike wiped out the possibility of the playoffs. So that's why when I say the most uh, meaningful event that I covered was the 95 uh, playoff game where Dennis Martinez beat Randy Johnson and the Indians went to the World Series. And in a typical Cleveland fashion, the Indians were up 3-2 to two in that series, but the last two games are in Seattle in the Kingdom. And I'm thinking, uh, Dennis Martinez was pitching six, game six, Charlie Nagin pitching game seven. And I just didn't like Charlie Nagin in the seventh game in the Kingdom. You know, just, it was a hard place to play. And Martinez went out, and everybody talks about what's a great play, Kenny Lofton scoring from second base. But Dennis Martinez outpitched Randy Johnson. I remember before the game, he was talking to Sheldon Oker from the Beacon Journal and myself. We just happened to run into him in the lobby. It's about three hours before. And he, Dennis would have these flowery phrases. He goes, I'm going into the mouth of the lion in this dome. Another time he says, I hope I'm not out there by myself. I hope these guys are ready to play in a big game. You know. Last time sports made me cry, well, probably it's not the event itself. It was when I was writing the book, Our Tribe, about my dad uh, when he was dying. And, it, and I, we kind of, I interwove uh, the story of the Cleveland Indians with uh, our family life in the same way my dad talked about Bob Feller or Ray Mack or Hal Trotsky or these players who grew up in League Park, like you would Uncle Myron and Aunt Pat. And, you know, a crazy cousin or whatnot. And so they were all together. And at that time, my dad was really in the final stages of his stroke and up all night. And I don't know if I was crying because of the book, losing him, fatigue, you know, from all that. But that, that was it. And that book, to me, is still probably the most meaningful one I have. Uh, I had a guy at this library signing mention to me that, you know, he bought it and he cried because it reminded him of his dad. How has the relationship between journalists and athletes changed over the decades? You don't get to know them as well. Most of the stuff is done in uh, group settings. I mean, I haven't had a one-on-one -on -one with LeBron since high school. Um, and I first interviewed him when he was 15. I mean, he knows who I am and everything. But I suppose if I really pushed, I could maybe get five minutes after. But I'm almost like, you know, such a mega star. Um, you used to be able to watch practice, you can't. Baseball still has sort of the best uh, access, you know, before games and that. You get to know some of the players. And my job, you get to know them more if you're covering the team home and away all the time. But my job is not that. You know, I spend more time um, cultivating relationships with general managers in the front office. Um, like Paul Dolan, the only interview he gave on Chief Wahoo was with me because he's known me for a long time. So that's kind of where I put a lot of where mine is. But, um, and I don't blame them a lot. I mean, if I were the PR guy for LeBron, I'd probably do the same thing. you got so much media, so much stuff going on. And I know even the teams themselves are trying to figure out, you know, how does we this website versus that versus the, what's left of the paper versus. So that, that's changed a whole lot of things. And, but you don't get as much. Um, athletes confronting you on things you wrote, like in the old days, they really would. Probably because there weren't, you know, there weren't that much all around, and also just kind of a wilder time, you know, they F-bomb you and all this stuff, because it, where now you don't get that, and I think they're kind of 
drilled and to not get into confrontational stuff a lot. Did you ever get f bombed? Oh yeah, in the old days, eighties. Confrontation, or what was the scariest confrontation you've ever had with an athlete? Miguel DLNA was mad at me. He was playing for the Indians in the early eighties, and he had been pinch hit for the day before. Got so mad he threw a bunch of bats on the field. And what was going on then, I didn't realize it till later, is I'm a young baseball writer then in my middle 20s, is naturally the Latino players are having trouble reading what is said in the story. Guys were telling them things in the story that were not true, making it sound worse than it is. So he came up and he was like, I felt like hitting you with this bat and this. I didn't think he was, but it was a little scary, you know, kind of looming over me. And I'm like, Man, you know, you, you showed up your manager, you threw these bats on the field, and you got there, and he finally just left. In fact, Sheldon Oker from the Beacon Journal came along and sort of stood by me there. And I was appreciated Sheldon for that. He got my Hall of Fame vote just for that right there. He's in the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame writer's wing. So, But that was, and, you know, I got, they used to throw French fries and stuff at you periodically. And I mean, it was just more of a boys thing. That stuff goes back to the 80s. I mean, you don't see a whole lot of that in the last 20-some years.